Hello, everyone. This is episode five of the Revisiting Era. The title of this podcast is going to be called Cultural Conundrum. Such an interesting name. I don't know how we came up with that. We're going to call it Are You Even Hispanic? With me, I have one of my great friends, Jocelyn. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name's Jocelyn. I'm a mix of South and Central American, born here, first generation, nurse, good stuff. I love it. Very simple. (laughs) Similar to me. Yeah. um, Both of my parents are from El Salvador. Where did you say you were from? Peru Peru. and Guatemala. Peru and Guatemala. Such a beautiful mix. I love that. So we met how many years ago would you say? Ooh, this is like 10. I know 10. That's a very long time. Um, I met you through your sister, Uh right? Yes. Okay. If I'm remembering correctly, I tend to block out a lot about my past, but you are one of the only people that I still talk to from that era (laughs) from the past and like I talk a a lot about that in these podcasts how like people have come and gone but there are still very few but very very important people I still keep in touch with and you are one of them so yeah congrats on that thank you that's special Uh, we're revisiting them we're revisiting them and what a better episode to do this topic with and with you because we literally just found out how many similarities we have it is crazy I didn't know that until we were planning this episode But yeah, our topic for today is, are you even Hispanic? Growing up as people of color, being immersed within the private school setting, we're going to be discussing the impact on how we were shaped by that experience, and how did it shape our course of life? How has it led us to where we are today? So I'm going to just open it up with the first question of discussion. Um, Describe your experience being enrolled in a private school as a Hispanic Latina. I I was looking back this past week like, ooh. What was my experience? I think in while I was in private school, you know, I didn't really recognize that I was different. I just had differences that it was it was just me. Good good times. It was a small school. Also some bad times, but good experiences, bad experiences. A good mix. Absolutely. Um, For me, you guys know, and you guys are probably sick and tired of me going on about my private school experience, but I often say how bad it was for me. It definitely can be different for each person going into it. My experiences might have been different, but there's also so many similarities that come into play with this. My exposure to private school, as some of you may know if you've been keeping up, um, I was enrolled at the age of four in a Christian private school. I very much had no say in the matter through all the 11 years that I went to this school. Early on, I started feeling um, very much like an outcast. I felt very different from day one. Mm. And I would attribute that to the location of this school, to many many factors given that this was part of a mega church like there were so many things that led to me feeling very different um and you said you went to like a smaller yeah not connected to any church gotcha Mm -hmm. non-denominational very small very into like literature and Mm -hmm. field trips and Mm -hmm. honestly i feel like my parents they worked really hard to get us into the school. I did it K through eighth. Mm-hmm. My siblings were there, which I think helped a lot. Like everything that was unique about us being Latino was like, oh no, that's just our family, you know? Mm-hmm. And then every family has their own little quirks. But there were some things where it's like, okay, that's just our family and that's just our thing. I didn't really attribute it to being Latino in general until like later on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, were there any other students of color in your class or was yeah. it just you? Yeah, so I had like a Korean classmate in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. There was one other Central American, North American, Latina mm-hmm. classmate. Um, very different, very, very proud and aware of her cultural heritage. And her parents were very into like sharing that. So I always thought like, oh, that's what Latina looks like. But we have our own things and that's just our family. So I don't know. Also recognize, I didn't recognize the fact that I'm, I have a Latino culture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, compared to me, like, I remember walking in and I wasn't the only person of color, but I could tell there's only like three of us Mm -hmm. and no one is Hispanic. No one speaks Spanish at home. Um, no one identifies a, as a Hispanic. Um, they didn't even know what Central South America was. Like, there was no, like, talk about mm-hmm. that. It was just an assumption, like, oh, you speak Spanish? Like, you must be a Mexican or whatever. Like, very early on, like, little things, which I did not take offense to. I mean, I didn't know any better. Um, 
But I do remember walking in, starting school, and always feeling different. And I'm like, hmm, why am I different? Like, I mean, it's it's fine. I don't want to be different, but I guess that's just how it is. And like you said, your parents worked very, very hard to get you into this school. My parents, they, my father was evangelized to by a pastor that went to the, that, that was affiliated with the school. And that's how I got the free tuition for the first couple years. And then later they began to pay. But it's just like it was sort of out of the blue. I was going to be put in public school. Um, Like no doubt in my mind, for sure. That was the way we were going to go. Like there was no such thing. And my parents weren't religious at the time. So I guess for me, it was a little different and how I it went about. But yeah, again, you said like there's so much good and there's so much bad. Um, What would you say would, would be like the good, like three points that stand out for you that were like, I'm glad I went to private school because this happened. I think um, I was super shy, yeah. but I think it pushed me to express myself. They were really big into drama. Everyone had to participate in the play, Whoa. which was kind of intense for someone that didn't like to talk in public at all. But like that really pushed me. I think public speaking was huge. Debate was huge. Presenting, that was all big. So I feel like that kind of, I think all four of us, my siblings, we all attribute the school, the private school to that skill. That's probably the biggest plus. Um, it's a it was a Christian school, but I feel like I didn't understand the gospel until like after, mm-hmm. much after. There are some things that kind of I remember that stick out. Yeah, I feel like that that was definitely a plus. Letting help, encouraging me to speak up for myself. And what about you? I guess a big one that stands out, which was a little bit hard for me to see in the moment, but. Growing up in the DMV, I guess, being having the opportunity to be in school with a smaller group of people with that being in that school, despite its many cons and like the humiliation that it brought with, I was safer in a way. Um, I know there's a stereotype that like children who come from low income households, which was my case, they are more likely to fall victim to a bunch of influences like drug abuse. Um early toxic relationships like bad influences when they are in the public school system and seeing other people that I knew go through that be seeing other people of like the same race go through that um it begs the question like that could have been me Mm -hmm. if I was exposed to certain groups and certain people but it wasn't me because I was around a bunch of rich white kids with parents who worked in the government and it just was a whole different vibe to everything um so in that part it was good like the safety I did not have that influence of like the dangers that come with being exposed to more of the real world did you like see that at all in your neighborhood? I did. I grew up in um, Annandale, Springfield, where there is a large, predominantly large Hispanic Latino population. And there's a lot of crime in the area. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my school was also, the private school was in Annandale, Springfield, but it was like a little bubble within itself. Like mm-hmm. it was that and then the world around it, the community around it, which mm-hmm. just, was just horrible um, coming, like thinking about it now. Like that is not a great place to grow up. I wouldn't want to raise my kid there. Um, but yeah, I would say just like the whole safety that came with that, like I'm grateful for it. I could have fallen into some type of thing that would have led me the wrong way. And thank God it did not happen. Um, another thing was, I guess, the academics. Um, I talk a lot about the learning disabilities that I had and how that made it very, very difficult for me to do school mm-hmm. at my private school. It wasn't until high school that I really felt like I was capable of succeeding academically. But I did get a good education in Mm. this school, no doubt in my mind, because when I got to high school, I was excelling above my peers. And that's not to say I did not like take advantage of that and go straight into like AP classes, which would have gotten me into top colleges. Like, no, I literally did the opposite and took regular because I hated myself and I had no self-esteem. But despite that, I came out of middle school after eighth grade. I was very smart. I didn't know I was smart, but I was smart. So I'm grateful for that. And then a third thing would be, I guess, learning the importance of, I don't know, building relationships with people because we unfortunately grow up around the same people Mm. and it taught me a lot on how to deal with relationships interpersonally with peers and like I guess it helped me cope a lot with like how to handle conflict because there's really like 
no way to avoid it you you're have to these you're stuck with these people you have to see them every day mm-hmm. are you gonna hold this grudge or not like it really like helped me learn that at a very young age mm-hmm. to the point that as an adult despite me holding these grudges against these people with other relationships that i made i was able to solve them pretty quickly i don't know i think that those would be my top three points yeah that's- what about negative yeah um i think for sure i grew up in south arlington a lot of Latinos around Mm -hmm. (laughs) me, a lot of like ethnic minorities in my neighborhood. And I think once we started in school, we kind of, all of us, you know, all four of us, we kind of made fun of the public schoolers were like, mm-hmm. oh, they're less than us. They have that style, the like curly gelled hair. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, that's such a South Arlington. But we were from South Arlington. But yeah. We had that. We mm-hmm. kind of just like looking down at people that had the same culture as you. For but I didn't sure. even understand that. Like the only idea of like, oh, that's a real Latino was my Mexican friend at the school that was very proud of being Mexican. Mm-hmm. But we didn't have that culture. Mm-hmm. We were sharing more similarities to the people that we were making fun of in our neighborhood. So that like prejudice, pride, thinking we're different, we're above, yeah. right, self-righteousness just in general. I think when you're surrounded by people that are trying really hard to be super morally correct, it turns into very much a self-righteous, like, I'm only sinning if I get caught type of outlook. Yeah, I think just not having peers that are from different cultures Mm -hmm. at home, I think looking down at my parents and then looking down at speaking Spanish, not wanting to speak Spanish with my parents at mm-hmm. home. That was a big struggle. Yeah. I'd be like, okay, Spanish only time. And I'd be like, I'm not speaking. Mm-hmm. I'm just staying quiet the whole yeah. time. So that was, I don't think I recognize that as wrong because none of my classmates were doing Spanish at home. Mm-hmm. Oh, just me and my family. So I think those are definitely the negatives. Okay. About you. Yeah. Um, I would definitely, to add on to your culture struggle, because I went to this school, I learned to hate my culture very early on. Mm -hmm. I think part of this was because both my parents, like, they knew, like, I was going to a prestigious private school, so now we have to accustom ourselves with the way that all these parents act, that all these families that go to the school act. And so in a way, I felt my parents really throw away the culture. Um, They, again, like I'm first generation, they immigrated here, um, my mom, the year I was born. So her culture was still very much fresh, but in a way I felt like because I was struggling so much to fit in, Mm -hmm. she would try her best to not integrate like Salvadorian culture in the home. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a little bit, of course, with the food and the traditions and like little things here and there. But when it came to being in the public eye with these people and these families, we would not act Hispanic. We would try to speak English, act as... uh, white as we could like it was horrible like the way we acted the way we dress like it didn't feel right to me um just spanish being my first language like it just was very hard in the beginning but eventually like the older i got the more i grew up around these same group of people I began to take up their mannerisms, their behaviors, the way they would want to do things. And Mm -hmm. like, of course, that caused strife in my family because it got to a point where I was like, I don't want to even engage in like the slightest bit of like our cultural things with you. I don't want to identify as a Hispanic Latino. I want to be like, I really want to not identify as like a person of color. It got to that point. And I'm disgusted in myself. Like as I grew up, like when I went to public school and high school, like it just all changed. And it was a big culture shock for me because I was so integrated and assimilated with the culture that I was brought up in Mm -hmm. that I literally wanted nothing to do with being Salvadorian. Mm. Um, Another thing would be being in a private school as a first generation My mom did not speak a word in English when we first started. Neither did I. So very early on, they would always like, the teachers especially would make little comments like, since you speak Spanish at home, maybe you should try being in this beginner group or they would I would be held back a lot Uh, I was held back in preschool kindergarten and then once I passed that I kept being held back academically like I would always be put in the beginner readers group even though I was very gifted literally like literally I was 
really good at reading and writing Mm -hmm. um and I didn't figure that out till years years later um but yeah things like that like they would hold me back from my potential and that's just a trend that I noticed and it was just passed on from teacher to teacher that I needed more time on this I needed the lesson to be taught slower I needed these little things I needed to sit at the front because I struggled more and in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't, like, I literally understand it. I'm as smart as everyone else. I'm very shy, so I'm not going to speak up. But yeah, I just felt very misunderstood and misheard, Mm -hmm. for sure. And I'm sure you can relate to that as well. You mentioned, like, the shyness that came with it, because we feel different, like, we're not going to speak up. That, the shyness, though, I think that was, it was a different having two older siblings that were like the stars of the school Mm -hmm. my brother always got like the best roles in drama he Mm. was incredible he like still is a a mythical creature in the drama program they reference him sometimes and then my sister too she would do so like they were like the stars Mm -hmm. and then I also had trouble reading in second like I didn't Mm -hmm. read till I was like seven eight so Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe that's the normal age to start (laughs) i think it is i for sure yeah seven and eight Mm -hmm. i know that they're like oh they they took i don't i'm actually questioning this now but i got diagnosed with dyslexia but then like learning about how you get diagnosed with dyslexia i didn't see a psychologist and they're the ones that diagnose you not an ophthalmologist Mm -hmm. i saw an ophthalmologist and i got Mm -hmm. diagnosed with dyslexia but i was like that's not who diagnoses you so i have a diagnosis of dyslexia And it took more time for me to read, but, like, it's not real, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the shyness, that started after sixth grade. Once I started, I was always the tallest in the class. And then sixth grade happened, and I stayed the same size, and everyone started to pass me. So I think that's that was the shyness, just me being awkward in Mm -hmm. general. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Being the odd one out, I mean, we're already... We don't, we already don't fit in. So what now? Another question would be difficulties and differences fitting in. Some of the ones we mentioned were language barriers, social economic status. Like, what do you have to say on those? Fitting in. I want to speak more to, because it seems like we both really assimilated to the like culture of the school. Mm -hmm. I want to speak more to the the opposite, like hanging out with my cousins Mm -hmm. in the like kind of setting myself apart or Mm -hmm. going to peru and then not speaking english perfect or yeah not speaking spanish perfectly i mean like not um being expected to speak well being expected to know the foods and like the foods and all this stuff and i was like i didn't grow up with this completely Mm -hmm. like i grew up with the food at home i think being bicultural like having peruvian and guatemalan too that was kind of confusing because very different foods very different cultures and our house culture was just different altogether. But I think not speaking Spanish well and being expected to speak Spanish well by, like, family mm-hmm. um, and then just other people in general, I feel like that was the biggest cultural difference. It's like I was – I didn't I, – I felt like I wasn't supposed to know Spanish because none of my classmates did. Mm-hmm. But then when I started going to Spanish-speaking church, I was like, oh – Everyone here knows Spanish, and I don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Everyone seems to be very friendly and hugging each other, and I don't like hugs. (laughs) Yes. I don't know. know. Yeah. The whole kiss on the cheek. Kiss on the cheek. I was about to say that. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Kiss Um, on the cheek. Yeah. I started going to public high school my freshman year. Yeah, Mm. yeah. That was the first time I was exposed to literally the public school was my freshman year of high school. And a thing that stands out to me relative to that is... I was too American to fit in with the Hispanic group Mm. and I was too Hispanic to fit in with like the American rich wealthy like upper class like a full American group and it's crazy because like at my private school like I was talking to these people that I grew up with and they of course came from wealth and like to me like I was like I can vibe with you I'm gonna seek out this group naturally I wanted to seek them out in Mm -hmm. high school and then I get to high school and it's like oh you're Hispanic like you're not we're Mm -hmm. not gonna vibe with you and then I go to the Hispanic like girls who are like taking like ESOL and I was like what's that I've never even heard of that like you you take a class in Spanish like that's cool but like I they didn't even want me in their group because mm. they're like you sound like a white woman 
And it was just like the biggest like identity crisis of my life, I would say, because it's like, who do I fit in with? Because I have been literally brought up in such a different environment than everyone here. I have no sense of culture. I I honestly don't even want to speak Spanish. Like it's not, it doesn't come natural anymore. Mm -hmm. After the 11 years in private school, my Spanish was so bad. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, going to Spanish church every now and then, like they would expect me to know and I just didn't know. Mm. again like I didn't have extended family I didn't meet them till I was 22 so I didn't have cousins to practice with I didn't have my family at home was very like they wouldn't be speaking out of the blue in Spanish to Mm. practice like it was very much like we have to assimilate we're in America we have to assimilate we don't want to associate with our culture we hate it and Mm. so that was very very hard for me um language wise um socioeconomically I say like I in private school like my parents like I came from a very like poor family compared to all my peers so um I don't know little things like transportation having food on the table like these are things and concerns kids that went to this private school never worried about Mm -hmm. and that was what was on my mind as a young child and I guess those differences really played a role in like my resentment towards my parents my culture my heritage Mm -hmm. um but then again I get to high school and I notice that I my family is really wealthy compared to a lot of my peers Mm -hmm. and in a way like I was very confused because it's a complete 180 you're in a whole new world when you're immersed with the public and i don't know a lot of a lot to process there late my junior year was when i finally felt like i could i don't know relate in a way to my peers and act normal and not have to pretend to be this or that Mm. so i don't know do you have anything similar of when you got to high school or yeah i mean i think the biggest shocker for me was seeing white people that lived in my same neighborhood i think that was Mm. crazy because in my mind all the latinos there were okay so like somewhere halfway through this there was one person a friend that joined who's from somewhere in south america i don't remember which country um and we immediately became best friends she didn't really speak or her some of her siblings didn't speak english at all when they first joined so they're very much you know from their culture born in their country and stuff and we immediately became best friends in my mind though like she lived in an apartment the other family they lived in a house but like not in arlington in fancy houses like the rest of my classmates did when you'd go to their house for play dates it's like this giant mansion oh that's the normal for white people and Mm -hmm. latinos live in smaller houses Mm -hmm. so like okay perspective i had latinos had small houses everyone else giant big houses big money whatever but then going to public school and then (laughs) meeting friends that like lived in my same neighborhood that were of different races, not just Latinos, was kind of cool. We had we had economically moved up at that point by the time I got to high school. Mm-hmm. We moved so that I could go to a specific high school, which also did not have a lot of minorities. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did a lot of AP, like all the AP and honors that I could do uh-huh. when I first started out. Um, following in my siblings' footsteps Mm -hmm. also. That's what they did. I did that. I did the sports they did. And then I think the biggest game changer was choir. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you participate. Like, I feel like that was the biggest equalizer. People that, like, were not in AP classes were being choir. Like, in my AP classes, it was mostly white or Asian. So my friend group, they were mostly, like, Asians from different countries um, that kind of had a similar background to me. Their parents uh, had moved here and then they had different foods and stuff. So like, oh, yeah, these are my people. Mm-hmm. Latinos, I didn't really see very many of them because either they were an easel, like you're saying, yeah. um, or just, I, I don't know. I didn't know very many Latinos in my classes. But I think choir, it didn't matter if you're a regular class student, honors class, AP, everyone's just singing, making beautiful music yeah. together. So that was... I don't know. You did dance or something, right? I did do dance. I started dancing when I was 10 years old and it was through, yeah, some of my classmates at private school. And immediately when I started dance, I was like, oh, this is a sport for wealthy people. Mm. I do not fit in. I'm not even good. I miss like 10 years of training, apparently. (laughs) Like I am so behind. But it's honestly like growing up in like this low-income household, the extracurriculars are not a thing. They never Mm -hmm. were. And so 
if I had the opportunity to do something, I would take it and run with it. And so I stuck with dance. I ended up doing it for 10 years after that, all the way in through high school. And you bring up a really good point. In high school, my senior year, I was accepted into a dance academy that was part of uh, the public school system in Fairfax. And so my senior year, I had the opportunity to dance with them. And I kid you not, I held that um, self-righteous um, thing to me that like, I... And better than all these public school students. I got professional formal training since mm. a young age. Like, I like I am gonna be the best one in this class. And I get there, and students are literally minorities. And I come to realize, like, we're all on the same level. But mm. I never expected to see someone of my same race and ethnicity at my level. Yeah. And so that was a big eye opener because, like, to a point, like they were better than me. And I was like, that can't be like, I grew up amongst the best. Like I was being trained at like these dance schools and studios and like doing everything these rich girls get to do. Like I was doing it too, you know? The only difference is you paid more for it. <laughs> I did. I know. I felt so scammed. Mm. Um, and I was like, how did they get this? Like what? Like it didn't make sense. And I was like, people come from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't matter. Like this is America. It doesn't matter if you are Hispanic or a person of color. Like we can all have different experiences, but all like the core connection is our culture Mm -hmm. and um going into that class i made the majority of my friends were people of color and it's something i never had let alone in the dance community Mm -hmm. i have never never would i have thought that i would be dancing alongside another hispanic girl who was if not better than me and it was very eye-opening i don't Mm -hmm. know i loved it it was like breathtaking because in the end like you said we're all a collective group of people pursuing art and it doesn't matter like our background our social economic status like where we come from our ethnicity does not matter we're all making art together and it's just so beautiful but yes. again like it's a, it's our skewed perception for me like i i never would have thought i mean that i would be in a room i think that's the beauty of growing up honestly it is because yeah. like i think about in getting outside of any bubble because if you think about it mm-hmm. same thing with the people that went to that private school they didn't get the the pleasure of being surrounded by people of different mm-hmm. ethnicities. Mm-hmm. And then we got to participate in that in dance and choir mm-hmm. and stuff. So it's like, wow, we did we did get this cool I don't know, I've talked about like being able to speak Spanish now. Yeah. And then like actually that's something I think we wanted to talk about too. At like one point where you like, I wanna know Spanish. I like wanna accept my culture. Did you have a point where you're like, Yes? I uh, your superpower. I- Unfortunately, no, because the older I got, the more I really just found my own group of people. And unfortunately, like by this point, my parents were doing nothing to keep our culture alive. And I had not yet met my extended family. I literally don't think it was until I started traveling to Central America as a full grown adult Mm -hmm. um, that I was like, wow, I missed out. And in a way, like, it brought sadness. And yeah, I did want me to, like, explore more about my culture, get assimilated, meet more relatives, reach out to people. Mm -hmm. Um, But in a way, I felt like this is unfortunately not me. It could have been me. And but it wasn't. And that's when I accepted it. And I was like, but that's okay Because Mm -hmm. I did grow up in America. I did grow up very differently than a lot of people. But I learned to accept that i learned to take it how it was at the end of the day we can't control how we grow up Mm -hmm. we're kids like we don't make that decision for ourselves how we're gonna be raised and like yes it came with a lot of suffering and like terrible experiences and a loss of culture but i do have the opportunity to travel as an adult i do have these opportunities to talk to my relatives to my grandmother to my Mm -hmm. aunt like i have these experiences now And I will cherish that because even though I didn't get it as a child, like I have it now and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't have a desire to really like pursue it a little bit more, at least not by myself. Mm -hmm. I guess with my mom, it would be different. Like I do want to experience like her culture with her and like in a community. But me myself, no, I don't have a desire for it. Unfortunately, my Spanish is pretty much still pretty bad. I think this is kind of what started the whole conversation, being Mm -hmm. called a coconut in spanish five or ap spanish describe that yeah so there is in ap spanish of course like there are all, there are a lot of latinos in that class i mean smart latinos i feel like latinos in the school that i went to were kind of all dispersed throughout the school so we didn't 
and there were not many of us. So I, I don't know. I feel like AP Spanish is where we all kind of got together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what did someone just call? She called me a coconut. She said I was white on the, what is it? White on the inside, brown on the outside. Yeah. So I'm like, ooh, what is that? I've always just been Jocelyn. What do you mean I'm brown on the outside? Like, I know I'm, I mean, I have brown skin, but like, what? I don't know. And like recognizing, like, I pro- when people see me, they think Latina. <laughs> so I don't know. I think after that, I was like, yeah. I, and she's calling me white on the inside. I've always thought on the inside, I'm just Jocelyn. <laughs> I'm not white. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just who I am. So st- after that, I started to explore a little more like, okay, like, yeah, I don't speak Spanish well, but that's because I didn't practice. So that's my fault. But like, also realizing that's because I didn't have friends that practice like that to speak Spanish with. And mm-hmm. there's the whole like, yeah, so just different different circumstances but it was really in college going to a mostly white school again Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then learning about social inequities and like all sorts of stuff in nursing and then starting nursing because there I feel like we get patients that speak Spanish only Mm -hmm. and so you have to speak Spanish well (laughs) yes because it's I mean in COVID it was sometimes life or death (laughs) so Mm -hmm. um I think when when that happened, it's like, yeah, I might sound dumb. I might sound not great, but like this could help them, maybe save them because using an interpreter through a face shield and a respirator is really hard. So me just being in the room and interpreting for really hard situations can help. So I think, yeah, it was after that where I was like, yeah, this is a superpower. Yeah, I'm never going to sound Peruvian. I'm never going to sound Guatemalan. And I don't like that, but I think I'm becoming more at peace with that. Mm -hmm. But I can still communicate with people, you know? And when I say I'm Peruvian, people or like half, I guess now I am Peruvian because I got my citizenship. Yeah. But so that's, I I mean, that happened in Peru, actually. They're like, oh, you're not even Peruvian. I was like, I am actually. Wow. I am Peruvian. So when I say that, Like, yeah, I don't sound Peruvian. I will try to say as few words as possible, but like people will immediately feel a connection. Or if I meet a patient that's from Guatemala, I'm like, oh my goodness, my mom's from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, oh my goodness, great. Start saying slang. I was like, I don't, I don't know that much. (laughs) My dad's not from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, yeah, I call it our superpower because it's like, it does build connections. And then also at the same time, we can have relationships with patients that are American you know, like mm-hmm. I, we understand American slang. So it's not like we're just isolated in one culture. We're not limited. Yeah. Mm-mm. We are literally, we have no limits. Mm-hmm. I, so kind of not really, <laughs> but that's, I don't know. Yeah. You bring up such an important point. Cause if there is one thing that I am proud of is to have that dual like ability, mm. like I speak English, I can, I can bond and like relate to American people, but also mm-hmm. like going into work immediately after high school in the customer service setting Mm. i learned that it is so vital to know a second language especially spanish in america oh my gosh that has been if not the most eye-opening thing to me because like yes i don't sound like legit like i speak my spanish is horrible and there's so many grammatical errors and everything i can't really write that well communicate but we can communicate and there have been so many instances where people have needed me to translate and i'm like wow like god put me there in that place to help you and Mm. I don't know. It is a superpower because not everyone has it. And I think like at times, like we take it for granted, but so many people only speak one language and just the ability Mm. and having the, um, the power to speak both of them can take you so far. It's gotten me jobs. It's gotten me ahead in my career. It's Mm -hmm. allowed me to have certain opportunities other people won't get because they don't have that. Um, So I'm incredibly grateful that if there was one thing my parents kept within our culture, it was a Spanish language and that I was able to learn it Mm -hmm. and that I mastered it at a point and like learning it at a young age, you retain that. Mm -hmm. And so that's really powerful. That language is able. And then I learned English and now like I yeah bilingual have a podcast yeah we have a podcast we can do it we can there's so much opportunity that comes with that for sure let's talk about the concept of shame i know it was brought up a little bit in like points you made but again like we said growing up 
in a private school did bring shame to our identity, like how we identified ourselves ethnic wise, how we did those little surveys of like, what are we like? It just brought like embarrassment and it shouldn't have. But those are literally like things that roadblocks that come with being exposed, being put in those environments as a kid, you know? Um, So recovering from shame, Mm -hmm. how did you go about that as you came of age? Recovering from shame, Mm -hmm. man. Like, being first ashamed of speaking Spanish. Not ashamed, but, like, kind of embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And then realizing, like, why would I be embarrassed? That's hurtful to my parents. I would never admit that, you know? They're both really proud of their own cultures. Um, But since they had different cultures, they I guess they didn't know. Growing, I feel like now it's turned transition to shame of uh, growing up in a rich, mostly white, private school and like also getting over that i feel like that's my my transition it's like okay looking down at like one upbringing and then wishing for another but then realizing that that's also being ashamed of the other so it's Mm -hmm. like i don't know just in general like there's the the life is the life we lived (laughs) it's what we got Mm -hmm. (laughs) we lived it it shaped us the hard stuff and the sad stuff and you know it all shaped us so i feel like not letting any of my past be something of shame Mm -hmm. I feel like that's something I'm really working on now. Like, yes, I grew up in South Arlington, but went to a private school in North Arlington and it mm-hmm. was fancy or whatever. But like, I'm neither of those things. I am Jocelyn and I I have experiences and I want to love people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Preach it. <laughs> but yeah, I think my heart will always grieve for my younger self mm-hmm. when it comes to how embarrassed and ashamed she was at the color of her skin and who Mm. she was culturally ethnically like my heart will always hurt for her basically but growing up i think exposure to the real world knowing that your life doesn't stop in this bubble where you are the only one Mm -hmm. like there are other people you will find your people basically Mm -hmm. and being able to do that has completely changed my life because I'm at a point where like the majority of the people of the friends that I have have so many similarities to me I'm no longer the odd one out like I don't have to be Mm -hmm. like I could definitely put myself in those experiences like when I travel back to Central America I am the odd one out Mm -hmm. and it's for the opposite reasons for the opposite reasons which is so funny but in a way like that's a lesson to be learned like that's more exposure that I get to have and so that's like really like that's really good and I know like as I grow I'll get more opportunities to have these exposures and things like that again just learning that self-love for who you are and I guess the main root of it all like again it goes to what I literally preach about mental health wise you were not in control Mm -hmm. where you were placed that was not your choice there was nothing you could have done to change the outcome but now you can Mm -hmm. you know you have that power you're an adult you have that control so to not be hard on ourselves basically Mm -hmm. for what our thoughts were how we perceive things and like for hating ourselves that self-hate is so damaging but i guess just learning to love who you are and that is a big struggle for a lot of people like I'm not just saying like it's easy as it is said like no it takes time it took me years it took therapy it took talking to people Mm -hmm. it definitely took getting rid of people like I don't know it took so much in me to learn to love myself and then like about so many insecurities that I had with my culture but as time progresses and as I was exposed to more things as I experienced with different career fields like these were definitely factors that helped me in Mm -hmm. the long run overcome the shame that came with that and i'm glad like we're healing like we're both healing and it's beautiful to see like where we are now because we love where we are and the people we talk to and we can talk to so many people i think that's a huge pro um i like what you said though like you're still taking the time to grieve there's mm -hmm. a party though like grieving something like not being ashamed doesn't mean you won't grieve Mm -hmm. like obviously we live in a broken sad world but like so it's appropriate to grieve but what is the bible saying we grieve without grieve like those who have hope Mm -hmm. like there will be a point where there'll still be differences in ethnicities and diversity and stuff in heaven the bible talks about that Mm -hmm. but there will be no like weird shame you know Mm -hmm. intermingled and all that 
Absolutely. So I just want to summarize today by listing like our takeaway points. And the first one is recognizing the beauty of diversity. Um, yes. The second one, I would say overcoming shame with culture. Like we said, it comes with growth and it comes with um, understanding on how to embrace things in a way that is personal, in a way that makes you you. Mm. Because we're all very like special and there's so much beauty that comes with being people of color, being people of a different race. Like it's just beautiful. And then what we do now to maintain the culture. I know you've been traveling. You travel to Peru. You yes. do things like that. Do you want to share more about what you've been doing? Yeah, I think. Um, well, the last trip to Peru was just to visit. But I think that was that was cool. Just visiting my grandmother. We have more of rela- a relationship. Last time I was there, I was there for six months. Mm-hmm. We got to hang out. I came to terms with the fact like I'm never going to be able to cook like she cooks Mm -hmm. but i can help i think just spending time with people and being able to like have a community there like uh i was when i was there for six months i was working with a church in cusco in a small town um mostly mix of spanish and quechua speaking Mm -hmm. so there was that whole other dynamic spanish wasn't the main language in some of these small communities especially with older folks quechua was so like i was coming like oh i'm gonna help people i speak english and i speak spanish i have peruvian culture and getting there i was like i don't Mm-hmm. have this Peruvian culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is very different. But then also like laying down my my perspectives of what being Peruvian was and like just coming in and learning about who they were, loving them, and then having an interpreter. I've never needed an interpreter. That's not true. Like for other languages, but I've never needed an interpreter for someone that's Peruvian, you know? Wow. Yeah. So that was a little weird. I was like, oh, this is an indigenous yeah. language. Yeah. So I, I think... Working in healthcare, especially, you work with moms. People are more willing to, like, share random stuff mm-hmm. with you. Um, it was, like, a pediatric mobile clinic and oh, wow. got a whole little babies. Different culture. Yeah. And not, like, judging it. Just coming in and helping out and participating and mm-hmm. recognizing that I'm not going to be an in person in this group. I'm just here. I don't know. It comes with being raw, being open and being raw and with ourselves and like being willing to be in that state of vulnerability and just like embracing things as they come, I guess is a huge thing. A big motif in our life for sure. Embracing Um, the uncomfy. The uncomfortable and the unknown. Um, But yeah, in the social work field as well, like I'm a social worker. Um, I work with a lot of people um, and then definitely the language thing we mentioned is very, very big. So I'm very grateful to have had both languages. Yes. I think that ties in. It's a little glimpse of our lives. Um, Thank you so much for being on this episode Dawson any final words that you want to say love the people not the color I don't know <laughs> love the people not the color it's so inspirational wow I don't know okay. um but yeah stay tuned for upcoming episodes we have way more guests on this series the revisiting era um so thank you guys for tuning in make sure to like subscribe um and stick around for more yes. bye thank you <laughs>